Hey friends, welcome to another episode of Area 312 Rock and Metal Podcast. I'm with your host Kent, along with my co-host Rex and my other co-host Mike. And today, friends, our very special guest, somebody who's been supplying us for years with the goods. We're like crack addicts of uh, Christian rock and metal. Mr. Greg Hayes of Girder Music. How are you, Greg? Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you guys for having me on. It's a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be able to share my love for music. Very cool. Thank you so much for gracing us with your time. Quick question for you, Greg. Uh, very important question. How do you feel about feeding the naked and clothing the hungry? I asked that. Feeding the naked. Are you with me now, Greg? And clothing the hungry. Friends, I was watching an episode of Greg's. It was on the uh, the Res Vinyl Remaster reissues. <laughs> but here's the more important question. Did you catch the email the other day when I said, um, what was, man, what was the word that I used? Okay, great. I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. Um, oh, I said, I said septics rather than skeptics. <laughs> I was referenced to uh, was referencing to these bundles we put out and yeah. people questioning, you know, being skeptical whether what if we're going to get garbage or if they're going to get good stuff, right? And pushing these bundles and and I said for the septics out there rather than the skeptics, <laughs> Put, putting them down. A bunch of septic people out there. <laughs> Uh, oh, those fourteen-hour days are catching up with me. Let me yeah. tell you. <laughs> now, I, I got a kick out of it, man. When you were talking on the res, you know, feeding the neck. I did door. catch myself though, right? <laughs> Say what, buddy? I did catch myself though. Yeah, you did. You did. You, you're like, what am I saying? Hold on. You know. Uh, great to have Greg. Friends, really quick, a quick disclaimer, and we're going to roll right into this. Um, speak with Greg, and what we just simply wanted to share was that we are certainly grateful for and very supportive. Of Greg and Gerber Music. Uh, we are also supportive of, of Matt Hunt uh, with Retroactive Records at Boone, Boone's Overstock. We're supportive of Bill Rocks and Scott Waters with Rocks Records and Limited Run Vinyl. Um, supportive of Girl Records. You know, it's all a big family. We're just thankful for our friends, our brothers out there who are uh, stepped up and giving us quality product. And just want you to know we're not being paid to promote Gerber. Uh, we simply took extreme interest in the forthcoming uh, Petra Classic album reissues that will be coming out on Murder, and we thought a general interview with Greg would be very interesting, so here we are. So, again, welcome, Greg, and Rex, I know you were the one plugging for this, and I'm just going to let you take it away. Buddy. Sure, sure. Well, Greg, I, I know that you're, um, from your videos, you're the son of a, a preacher, and could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and growing up and your musical experiences uh, during that time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my dad was an Assemblies of God Pentecostal pastor, grew up in church my whole life, grew up with, uh, um, you know, supportive parents um, in one regard, and that's until it came to me wanting to listen to Black Sabbath and ACDC and they quickly did this with their fingers and said um, we've got something for you I want to introduce you to Jimmy Swaggart and Sandy Patton and you know I kind of like a dog that doesn't understand was kind of like doing like like what where's the rock and roll so obviously um, so I'm 51 so born and raised in you know throughout the 80s and when bands like um, my first album that I ever owned was something my grandma purchased for me. It was called The Archers. And it was really cool. It was spreading like wildfire. It was cool because I heard some guitars in there. And I was like, well, that's fascinating. I think I got it for like a eighth grade graduation with a Sony Walkman, but probably wasn't a Sony Walkman. It was probably some off-brand. But I saw a friend with a Sony Walkman. I had to have a cassette player, Sony Walkman. And then I quickly found something at a youth camp called Petra that I'd never heard of before. And they were playing an album called More Power To You. And we don't need to really dive much into that because anybody that's in this music knows exactly um, the pivotal point of so many of these albums. For me, it was that one. But for everybody else, for all of you guys, you had a different album, right? And um, so finding 
Christian rock was a thing and diving into Res being from Chicago, just dove into Res DMZ, couldn't believe. I mean, today, two of my all time favorite albums or, or Rainbow's End um, from Res and, you know, maybe, maybe probably Mommy Don't Love Daddy anymore, but Awaiting Reply, I think would probably even surpass that one. Um, two of my all time, you know, favorite albums. I still listen to them, still great classic rock stuff and hoping someday to put those out on vinyl, something that we've been working heavily towards. Um, but so that's kind of how I grew up, right? And just bought everything. I worked, my first job was at a Christian bookstore called The Love Shop, super creative name. And, um, you know, uh, bought everything. I mean, every paycheck went towards more music, um, buying more cassettes and stocking up and people would come over and go like, oh my goodness, you know, you're 16 years old and you've got 350 cassettes you know, of Christian rock, which they're all still sitting over here in a corner, a big chunk of them. Um, just, it's been a passion and love of mine since, you know, 16 years old and now at 51 and 2021, you know, it's been a lot of fun to do this. So. Are you my twin brother, Greg? I mean, your, your background sounds a lot like mine with as many cassettes. And, you know, I think most of our first loves were with, uh, Petra. Yeah. You know, Greg X both stuff. But yeah. Great. Yeah. It, it's been, you know, it's, it's fun because, you know, when you dive, you know, one of the biggest mistakes that people can make in business is getting emotionally attached to making business decisions. And I often have, as a business owner, I have to detach myself from the music that I love, but that becomes a problem because it's the music I love and it's the space that I'm in. And so given opportunities to put stuff out, that sometimes does well in the market, sometimes doesn't. I've put things out and released a hundred copies of something because I wanted one. Yeah. You know, that generation brutal reality. It's like, I, I like, I don't care. Like if anybody buys, I, I have to have it. Like, I love that album. You know, Wonderland Records was um, in uh, far kind of like a Elgin area of Chicago, um, far Northwest suburb. And, you know, they were, you know, I went and saw Shout and Vengeance at the Wonderland Ballroom, I think they called it or whatever it was called up there. And, uh, you know, Wonderland Records went on putting out Fighter and some of these other stuff. And so had great connections with Cesar Kalinowski from back in the day and was able to put some betrayal out and was, Fighter out. Was it Generation or Under Midnight? It's been a few years, but Bruce Franklin of Trouble. He was in one of those bands. Was it Generation or Under Midnight? Generation. I think he actually did both. Okay. I think he was connected with both, but I know he definitely was uh, in Generation. Yeah, another another great band. That yeah, I'm a big. One of the Light album by Trouble was just uh, a, one of the one of the amazing albums that came out in those days. And everybody loves Psalm Nine. Mm -hmm. I just was a fan of Run to the Light. Yeah, I, I've got them all. <laughs> I just like Trouble. <laughs> was that one? Was that Enigma Records? That Run to the Light one? Metal Blade. Was that always oh, Metal Blade? Mine was Metal Blade. Yeah. What you said about putting out, you know, 100 CDs or whatever because you wanted one, um, to me that struck a chord because um, when you first announced that you were releasing these uh, remasters with the Petra bundle, you know, um, the thing that made me had to get that, have to get that, was the fact that you were doing This Means War. Because that is an album that, for me, I have wished since it was released that there was a better version of it out there. Um, <clears throat> you know, the ideal dream would be to have a remix of it where they bring the guitars up. Um, but I'm very, very hopeful <laughs> that, you know, the remaster you've done will uh, improve at least the sound of that album. And that's the main reason I went ahead and pulled the trigger and bought those. So. Well, um, it did. They showed up a few days ago yeah. and uh, they sound stunning. We can't really you know, release until our release date, but shipping will begin soon for anybody that's waiting for the CDs. There's been a, uh, I'll just throw this out since we have an audience here of people listening. Um, if you order the vinyl, 
the vinyl doesn't come out till January, maybe even February. It's, it's a massive backlog in the industry. And uh, last night I counted, um, I had 157, 137, sorry, people that have said, hey, where's my Petra vinyl? Like they didn't <laughs> even know it was a pre-order, right? Like 137 people have wanted to know why they haven't got their Petra vinyl. So if you're on this and you're listening, it's coming. It's a pre-order. Whenever you see a release date and bold letters at the top of those product descriptions, that gives you all the information that you need to know. Um, and we do try to ship on or before release date. There's an occasion product shows up late and it doesn't go out till the day of or a week after because there's delay. But it's not because we're sitting here and we just don't want to ship something. <laughs> yeah. But uh, those Petra CDs, um, I'll tell you the one thing, it takes a lot to impress me. It does. I'm a graphic artist. I'm a graphic designer. I've done a lot of the stuff, um, but I've turned over a lot of my work to Scott Waters um, because we built a friendship too, and he does great, and he does it for a living now, and I just move at such a speed and such a pace that I need somebody else to help um, kind of pull that in. He did a stunning job on the layouts for these Petras. I've never had three CDs in my hand that I was more proud of. You know, it's kind of cool seeing my name on the back. Uh, but beside the point that they just, they sound great. They look great. It feels new again. I don't know how else to say that other than when you grab it and you look at it and you compare it to the old ones, like I didn't know it could get more vibrant more, with more definition just from an art perspective. And then you got the trading cards inside, which are a credible bonus. I love that stuff. I, I, I love trading cards. It, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of this stuff, um, but football and basketball, but you know, it's, it's really cool when you listen to the music, man. So, and I don't promote my stuff like this, but I mean, I'll stand behind this stuff. It's so great. We are, well, all three of us are Petra fans, you know, Greg, and we are promoting it. <laughs> and you are the one who is distributing. You're the one who garnered the deal. And while we're discussing Petra, um, I'd like to ask two questions, and I don't know if the answer is no or what. You said you had them with you. Now, I'm sure with Girder, you want the exclusivity of showing it first on your channel, but is there any way you could at least pop up a front cover and just let us see if you have them? Can um, you do that? And, I think they're all in the back warehouse. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Because if I have them here, I'll definitely, I'll definitely will. Um, I keep, I keep boxes of all my own stuff. Sure. You know, nice. um, just so that I can reference something when somebody says, hey, why didn't you put the original release date down in the copyright information? And I'm like, I didn't, you know. Um, <laughs> That's okay, buddy. I don't, I don't think I have them, but um, I can grab them real quick. No, 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 no. That's that's okay. Buddy. I have to walk away we from know, the screen, though. We know you have a uh, an important business meeting before too long. So my, my other question, Greg, is um, staying on the Petra note here, um, and I'm sure hoping this could happen, and I don't know if you can answer this from a business perspective, because I know some things have to be played close to the chest. Oh, please tell me, have you entertained the thought of reissuing and giving the deluxe treatment to the wonderful Never Say Die album and not of this world album? So let me address that in two parts. Um, the kind of, there's a process that we go through um, <laughs> I'll, I'll actually answer the question directly and then I'll give a little bit more insight. Um, we entertain the thoughts of everybody. Um, of course. I mean, those are elite, elite albums. Um, so some of the, uh, some of the, the decision making that goes into it is obviously, you know, we take into uh, people requesting stuff, right? But we're not necessarily keeping a database of every single time Joe and Amy and Steve and Bob ask for something. We're not exactly putting it on a spreadsheet, but when the stuff comes through enough, we do that. We also look at what's currently on the market. How much is it going for on the market? Can people get original releases? Is it out of print? Um, 
And if it's out of print, are there 95 people selling copies on eBay or has it not been listed in a couple years because you simply can't find it? That's one of the steps that we go through. Another step that we go through, which is the biggest step of all, is what does it cost? Um, I'm pretty open about financials, so I don't mind sharing some numbers here because I think it's important that people understand two things. We can't just decide we want to do something and put it out. You have to have record labels. You know, there was a lot of really sketchy, um, very questionable business practices happening in this industry back in the early 2000s. A lot of um, thieves, a lot of people manufacturing and producing stuff that wasn't legal. To do they didn't have the rights from the record label the artists weren't getting paid a dime which is a whole nother topic which we'll dive into in a second because the record label hires the artist to make them an album it's not owned by the artist so when everybody's like i don't understand why john schlitt won't let you john schlitt has nothing to do with it bob hartman has nothing to do with it it has everything to do with who owns the masters and can we get the rights to it and then what i was going to get to is how much it costs it costs on average for some of the bigger labels, it costs on average about $10,000 for each release. So do the math real quick. Three Petra, two Bride. That's just to license the stuff and to pay for mastering. That doesn't include artwork. It doesn't include um, Scott Waters to do the, you know, all the artwork. It doesn't include Rob Caldwell doing the remastering. It doesn't include any manufacturing cost. And so you can kind of get a clue real fast how much effort and energy and time and money it takes to, to pull this stuff off, which I'm grateful and honored that I have ability to do that. Um, you know, when I was sitting at the bank wiring money to Capitol Records or Universal, um, I sat there with such gratitude of, I get to do this. They can never license Petra to anybody. Mm -hmm anybody they have said no 200 times to people why do i get to do it why like what what makes me and i just keep going back to i'm just a blessed man you know and gratitude and happiness is everything and you can wake up every single morning you know it took a real close friend of mine to commit suicide to wake me up up here and to learn the value and the importance of what Christianity talks about, what my Bible talks about, and living life to the fullest and just being happy. And so as I sat there wiring money, you know, going like, oh, can't believe I have to send them. <laughs> what did I just do? You know, um, and the full blown, because nobody even knew what was coming. I had to do the contract, had to pay for it before I could even tell Scott or tell Rob, or tell Matt, or tell Bill, or have any conversation with anybody about what I'm doing. I had to pay them first. So I'd take my money and pay it, right? And I'm not Amazon. I mean, this isn't like a multi-million dollar corporation. This is Greg doing this. And yeah, I mean, I've got some staff, we've got some people that do something, but you know, just so happy. So I wanna go back to your question about the other Petra albums. I can absolutely guarantee you one thing. After I saw how well people um, appreciated um, This Means War, More Power to You, and Beat the System, which were, by the way, my three favorite Petra albums, and since I got to pay for it, I got to choose. Um, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I could just make stuff up, but I'd rather just tell people the truth, right? So they were my three favorite albums. And a lot of people, like, I thought I was going to take a bath on Beat the System. Like, I, have to what? I thought I was going to take a bath, meaning a financial, I thought I was going to absolutely um, lose financially on Beat the System. And the stuff has to be profitable because it gives you the money to do the next projects. If it's not profitable, and if, and if oh, brother... I'm just doing it as a blessing to the Lord. It's a business. I'm here, I'm here to make money so that I can do the next project. Right. It's still a business under the Lord, 
it's still a business that I operate in. Um, and I still am blown away by some of the lyrics. I mean, I was in tears. I was typing the lyrics out to one of the fighter songs. And um, I've, what was the lyrics? I've lived my life in a world of doubt. And as I'm typing that, I'm like, man, I lived 40 years of my life like that. Depressed, upset, angry, disappointed. All that junk. You know, we go through things in life, you know, mm -hmm. and lived my life like that. And I typed those words. I'm like, man, this stuff is still powerful. I know I'm rabbit trailing, so let me get back to Petra. I'm going to do everything in my power to put out all the Petra stuff um, that I possibly can. Uh, within reason. I will tell you this, right now, Word, Curb Records, they won't license anything to us. So the later catalogs, the later Patrick catalog, um, Beyond Belief, Unseen Power, some of those, they're all owned by Murr, Word, which is all part of Curb. It's all part of Mark, Mike Curb's company. Um, we've asked, we've gone down the road, but you know what? Universal also said no three years ago. Mm -hmm. That would also include the first two Petra albums yeah. in the 70s. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that self-titled and Come and Join Us. Yeah. Or, I love that Come and Join Us album. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, you know, the the, the classic Petra, which, I mean, that can, I don't know. I think the the ones that really, well. For, well, let's, let's go through this because you're getting ready to hit that point. I, Let's here's go the one thing about Never Say Die, Greg. Never Say Die, the one thing that's always uh, kind of agitated me a little is that I do have the CD of that, but it's the two-on-one with Wash's Wider Man. It's yeah. never been a, it's never been able to stand alone on CD, really. And um, Well, I knew, I knew Wash's Wider Than was that way, so it was also Never Say Die was never on CD, never had a full album on CD. No, it was no. not by itself. Not by it itself. It came together. With, and they took two songs off Washes Whiter then to make it fit. On one CD. So, okay, so Never Say Die was out, but it was with Washes Wash Whiter. Martin version of Washes Whiter Man. Right. Right. Was any of the songs missing from Never Say Die, or was the whole album yeah. on No, that? you got all of Never Say Die, but you lost right. two songs from Washes Whiter then. But they don't. Here's my point is Never Say Die is in the same league as – more power to you and not of this world. I mean, you had Praising the Lord, you had Without Him We Can Do Nothing, Chameleon, Angel of Light. It was the beginning of that classic Greg X. Bowles years. And forgive me, but Wash is wider than, that was with Rob Frazier, and I know Greg was in there too, but that was their very transitional album. And the two don't mesh. To me, sometimes less is more, Greg. And what I mean by that is, is, Never Say Die needs to stand alone. It doesn't mesh well fluidly with the music that's on Washes Wider Than. It ruins the continuity of the album. If that makes any type of sense. I don't yeah, know if yeah, that... 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. So, so let's go through this. So if you're all three Petra fans, what are your favorite albums? Rex, go for uh, it. Um, how many do you want me to give? <laughs> I mean, more power, well, more power to you. I guess I'll go. I'll go both vocalists. More power to you, probably for Greg Volz, and man for John Schlitt. I'm gonna say on fire is my that thing rocks on fire. Greg, a lot of people ask for on fire a lot. That yeah. would be incredible for a, a remaster. Yeah, and for me, uh, it's well for for the for the Greg Volz years. It's definitely more power to you. For the John Schlitt years, it's it, it's tight. It's between On Fire and Beyond Belief. It's one of those. Yeah. I would love to do Beyond Belief. Yeah. And uh, you talked about Never Say Die. Yes. For I me, <clears throat> for me, Greg, expressly, anything beginning with Never Say Die up through Wake Up Call. To me, that is the 
those are the best years of Petra. I would agree. There's a lot of albums in those years. <laughs> now, I do like the first album. I appreciate that album. I have it. I do have Come and Join Us. But Never Say Die through Wake Up Call is um, everybody needs those albums as far as yeah. Petra. And yeah. Total Confession, I love Petra, but I have had their complete catalog. I have decided several years ago that I didn't really need to hold, in making room for some other stuff I wanted to glean, I let go of everything past Wake Up Call. I don't have anything Petra. That's, you know, but that's just me. Even I, 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 I feel the same way. It's like the later stuff, you know, our taste in music changes, you know, as we get older and you just move on to other things. And, and you know, this is one of the topics we talk about often, like back in the day, we only had 40 bands to choose from compared to the mainstream secular market, right? That had 14,000 compared to our 40, 50, at least Christian rock, Christian metal, right? Until Tooth and Nail came along and it was just pure metal and, you know, some of those labels out there, there wasn't a whole lot to choose from. So we loved everything, right? Everything was great. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, Petra, you remember the slogan, Petra means rock? Mm -hmm. From Never Say Die, I'm, we, could, we could count the first two albums as well in the 70s, uh, ex, ex, excluding Marsh is wider than, but specifically for me, Never Say Die through Wake Up Call, that's when Petra meant rock. Did you, did you also get rid of Jekyll and Hyde? I mean, that's that's like one of the heaviest albums they did. <laughs> I did. I did. And I'll tell you why, Mike. Uh, There's a lot to appreciate on it. Yeah. But Bob Hartman, his souls were taken out of that album. Well, they, I don't think he did any. <laughs> they didn't let yeah. It, it. Yeah. It, it's great. I'm glad they got back to meaning rock, but it yeah. wasn't total Petro. Because Bob Solos, uh, I, I thought I had heard somewhere or somebody mentioned that they were kind of stricken from the, I thought he did solos for them and they were stricken out of the mix. I can guarantee you knowing the recording process, um, they did everything for every song. And that's what the editing process is for, is to, well, what do we want to keep? What do we want to leave out? You know, it's not like you go and you record a song and then that's what it is. And like, oh, I didn't record guitar solos. Like, there's, I'm sure there was like plenty of that stuff available. Now, was it actually captured? Did they actually have it? Did it make it on the tape? Um, are you guys CD, vinyl guys, both? What do you guys? I am CD. And the reason why, Greg, is now I love vinyl. If I had my choice, it would really be vinyl for, that's like the deluxe of anything. I choose CDs for two reasons. Number one, I, I don't have just an expensive record player, but I am I am always afraid and horrible with scratching records. So, <laughs> I, never I, done that before. I, yeah, I, I absolutely, I, and I'm mortified. I mean, uh, so to me personally, CDs hold up better for my personal usage. And the other thing is, is see, I'm not a radio guy. When I get in my truck and I travel, I'm popping in, I'm popping in a CD. And uh, by the way, excellent, excellent release, Gerda Records, The Brave. Anyway. Uh, um, that album right there, yeah. you guys know both, you guys all know The Brave, right? Yeah. yeah. That album, um, I promote that as one of the biggest surprises that people just didn't know about. Thankfully, I'm talking to three guys that I'm preaching to the choir when I say this stuff, that you know how great that album is. Yeah. That album is too too good um, to pass on. That album is just as good as some of the stuff that Holy Soldier put out. Oh, man. This and was in 92 when this was released. This was, Yeah, I got that year right. Well, that was that era, right? That 92, you know, yeah. I'd say 94 changed music. When Nirvana came on the scene, it single one band single-handedly out of Seattle changed the entire music yeah. space. Yeah. And, 
you know, everything that everything was kind of before. So, it, but it was beginning that process from late 91, right into 92, up through 94, music began a huge shift, yeah. right? Tooth and nails on the scene are beginning the early process of some of the stuff. Music's turning into hardcore. You go to Cornerstone Festival and you're scratching your head and all these 80s hair metal dudes, because um, I don't know about you guys, but I used to have huge hair. Yeah. Don't make fun of me. I had the mullet. Um, yeah, I did too. I eventually cut my hair off and got got the little mullet going. But we were like, we were going like, what what where, where's our where's our music with the guitar solos and the hammer ons and the yeah. you know the the pull offs and like where where's the solos right uh, Jekyll and Hyde conversation right that we were just having earlier right where's the guitar solo well you know thankfully it's back again and you know eighties retro stuff has just been you know, blown up for many, many years and people realize how good the music is. And yeah. I'm great to see that grunge music lasted the short time that it did. Well, I used to be CDs, Greg, um, and I do buy your CDs but I do a lot of iTunes digital just because I have so much music. My iTunes library is like literally over 400 gigabytes. So if you can imagine how many CDs that would be. So are you taking your CDs and putting them into iTunes and listening yeah, to them? Yeah, I'm ripping them. I had done that like um, years ago now. So you're not really doing Spotify listening to Apple Music. No. To no, those. no. You're more just I make my own playlist. I have like 1,700 playlists. And you know, just whatever. How many? I think seventeen hundred. <laughs> yeah. Do you realize how much four hundred and twenty gigabyte uh, of music is <laughs> on, a, on a laptop? Think Rex, about that. Rex, do you realize how crazy you are? I have a problem, Greg, <laughs> and, and and you're not helping it because they keep buying more. He's the supplier. <laughs> We're the addicts. <laughs> but I just have a few you can see behind me. There are some artists in that that I'll buy their CD, but most of the things I buy is digital. But I, like, I know I know what problem is. There's about three million pieces of product, just a few steps that way. I show them, show them your latest CD acquisition, Rex. Well, here I'm going to do some promotion, Greg, for Good. you. But we got to get to Michael. I want to find out about his. Ah, the there we go, Bride. And the remaster of Kinetic Faith, I'm trying to show this. Yep. Um, excellent, excellent. So for people that don't know, explain what the Bride Long Box is. Um, well, back in the day, like from the mid-80s to like sometime in the 90s, to try to stop theft of small CDs and, and stores, they would put items out in a long box, and that way you couldn't shoplift it as easy. So Greg had this awesome idea for the Bride remasters to issue um, Snakes in the Playground as a long box, and you got an extra trading card with it too. So this was really cool, Greg, a great idea. You know, there's an interesting thing that's in this music industry, um, and Michael, I'm not going to forget because I want to I want to ask you about you know vinyl CDs, but just want to throw this from the bright. Nobody understood the value of the cardboard that those long boxes were made out of, um, and what I mean by that is the collectability, because there is two types of buyers in this industry, two types of people that come and purchase at Girder Music, and that is people that listen to music and people that collect music. Sometimes they're one and the same. Sometimes they're just collectors. Um, we get a lot, a lot of people that come in and they buy two of everything because they want to keep one sealed and they want to keep one open to listen to, right? They're tired of scratching their records when they want to know that they got one completely sealed that's never been scratched. Uh, Kent might know what I mean. And so, you know, um, there's collectors. And so we just thought the we thought the long box thing would just be gimmicky, fun. It was stupid expensive, but I'm like, I don't care. I'm doing it anyway. And um, yeah, it was fun. I think the additional trading card in there was kind of cool too. The did, you, skin. Did, you, did you sell out of those yet, Greg? The long no, we still no, we still we still have we still have copies of them. I believe we did five hundred. Long boxes, I mean, it's getting down there, um, and they probably will be gone by the end of the year, you know, as soon as Christmas hits. Yeah. 
Michael, tell me about CDs and vinyl. What are you, what do you? Well, I, I primarily do CDs just because of the uh, uh, security of knowing they'll be around for a long time, but I do still have vinyl. I have some vinyl that I still have from way back in, you know, the 80s. And um, in fact, I have an original To Hell With The Devil on vinyl with the angel cover. Um, um, I do have a record player and I probably would buy more vinyl again, except that mostly the sticker shock of it, you know, when, you know, back in the eighties, you could pick up a vinyl for 10 bucks, a CD would cost you 15 probably. Nowadays, you know, the, the CD will probably cost you 15 and the vinyl will probably cost you 30. So yeah, the average, I think the average price of a vinyl right now is just looking at some trends. The average price is twenty nine ninety nine. Yeah. for vinyl i was at yeah. record store day the other day and i mean i saw like single vinyl going for 65 dollars 67 dollars oh, yeah. 68 dollars it was a regular it was a regular thing there didn't seem to be much that was under the 29 dollar price point you know even vinyl with two songs and so it is a but bit more expensive here, but. here's an interesting thing though my 22 year old daughter i've given her a lot of my vinyl and i gave her my record player to use so she listens to vinyl. <laughs> yeah. So I'm yeah, kind of that, passing it on to the next generation. Well, that is probably the biggest thing that people, yeah. you know, are, are maybe, you know, confused. And I think uh, the, the understanding of why vinyl is making a comeback, I think, is a really good topic. And that is that um, it's making a comeback for a couple reasons. And one is you have to understand our age compared to other people's age. So if we can just discuss that, um, is is everybody here above the age of 45? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. We're all 50 and above. Okay, so everybody's 50 and above. All right, so let's talk about um, millennials, maybe even 18 all the way up to maybe 33 years old. They grew up with um, iTunes. They grew up with Spotify. Spotify was around when those 18 year olds when they were three spotify was a thing and their mommy and daddy was listening to spotify they mom and dad was probably also hollering at alexa across the room you know and but so that you help understand that stuff is as common for them as maybe a flip phone was for us right so that's something that they've known their whole life now they want something different because that's all they know. Just like we didn't want a flip phone, we wanted something different. And we're like, oh, cool. They make these things called iPhones or whatever, right? Your Galaxy. Um, we want something different, something new or something modern. I can push buttons and I don't have to go. Right? So, you know, it, uh, not that flip phones had a rotary dial, but you get what I'm saying. The point is when they want something different, they're like, oh, well, my, my, 33 year old mom um, has a bunch of CDs. That's really dumb. Uh, and then Billie Eilish drops vinyl and Taylor Swift drops vinyl and these other people um, are dropping vinyl. And now everybody out there is putting out vinyl. And I'm starting to see a real trend with cassettes now that they're putting out cassettes. Like when I saw David Crowder three years ago drop a cassette, I was like, huh? Like that's really cool. <laughs> so but the point is, vinyl is making a massive comeback because people have gotten really, really good at, companies have gotten really good at putting out Audio-Technica LP-120s for $199. That sounds stunning. Stunning. That thing is heavy, just like the old turntables were. It looks vintage, it looks old, but yet it acts and operates modern. And it's one, if you replace that needle on that thing, and I still have an old, you know, Onkyo receiver and an Onkyo CD player with some infinity speakers on either side. You know, I still kind of have an old school setup to a degree, but these turntables are just primo and they're not, I mean, there are hundreds of dollars, but they're not hundreds of dollars. They're 200 bucks, maybe 260 now, I don't know, on Amazon, but they're really, really high quality and they sound amazing. Can put that next to one of those little briefcase turntables that are absolute garbage. A Crosley, a thing you pick up on the in cap at Target or Walmart. Now you walk into Best Buy, um, 
even walk into some of the Walmarts and Targets, you'll now find these turntables back there with all the vinyl that you can pick up. So they're making it easier to listen. And now you can buy Bluetooth speakers that you can Bluetooth right with these things that sound absolutely stunningly great. I, I have five kids and I bought a couple of them, the exact same turntable with speakers and they love it. And I mean, all my kids are into vinyl and listening to vinyl and love it. So I'm not surprised hearing more and more people every day. I have more conversation about, you know, my 20 year old, my 18 year old, my 25 year old, you know, they really, really like vinyl. Like we say it like it's a new thing. They really like vinyl. <laughs> like, like that should surprise anybody. If you listen to more power to you on vinyl compared to CD, it feels like you're listening to something completely different because you hear stuff that you don't hear on the CD and don't even get me started about MP3s, you know, on iTunes, you're just losing music. They take all that stuff and they compress it down to get it to fit a bandwidth. And so you have to leave stuff out. It's called data that you leave off. And so you're losing the quality of the music. So 180 gram, those vinyl grooves are built like this, right? And if you don't squeeze too much music on the vinyl, your needle sets down. If you leave that thing open, you only put 22, 23 minutes aside, you have those grooves wide open, that needle sits right down in and that's where all the bass is at, right? So you get that substance and that quality. How many times have we heard people say with vinyl, like, it just, it's a feeling and I can't explain it. It's, it's just, it, it's just wide and has depth and they don't have the right language because they don't understand the technology and it just sounds good. Now, obviously CDs sound perfect, right? You have a good system, CDs sound great, but vinyl, you will experience something quite different. So it's not a surprise to me, regardless of what we want to do and how we want to listen to music, vinyl is inconvenient. It's just inconvenient. You know, it's made of cardboard. The jackets are, they bend, they get worn, the vinyl gets scratched, right? It's inconvenient. So it takes effort to go back there and take one and turn over. And then 20 minutes later, you have to go flip the thing over and, oh, I need to take my rag. I need to clean it off real quick and blow all the dust and make sure it's dried. And then, you know, drop the needle and just adjust the volume and then turn back around and do what we were doing. All that takes time compared to, or clicking something on iTunes, it's just simple, and you can just let play for the next 12 hours mindlessly in the background while you're doing your thing. And so it really does um, take some effort. I listen to both, love both, I'm a fan of both. Um, it'll be really weird because I grew up with cassette tapes. Yeah. Same so here. It, it wasn't until 1990 that I bought my first two CDs, which were Baron Cross, State of Control, and Mass Voices in the Night, my very first two CDs in 1990. Uh, I've heard a lot of people, Greg, say that vinyl sounds warmer. Um, and yeah, that was the word I was looking for earlier, and I came up with 37 other words other than the word warmer. So the last thing I'd like to throw out there to you to make my joy complete, something to think about, Res Band Hostage. Gurr hasn't released that in years. I think the album's kind of poo-poo because it had some new wave leanings, but there's a lot of gems on that album. And uh, boy, if that ever got the, the CD hasn't been released in forever. And, uh, that's just yep. Res, Res is interesting when it comes to rights to the stuff. Mm -hmm. So, because their early stuff, uh, the first two albums are on the Word Curb catalog. They're middle of the ground blue tapes. Sparrow, was that Sparrow? Sparrow. Sparrow. Yeah. Um, that's all Capital Universal, sort of. It was EMI that went to CMG, that went to Court Music Group, that went to Word for Distribution, but was owned by Universal. And things kind of do this in, when it comes to ownership. And so Word even has a spreadsheet of stuff that they don't know that they own. And the biggest thing that happened was the fires that happened out in California and the big massive warehouse that burnt down with all the masters. One of the ways that they could prove 
when they couldn't find a contract that they could prove that they own it is did they actually have the original stampers for the vinyl or, and usually they didn't, but master reels, right? Did they actually have something that alluded to they own it? So record companies have done two things. They've assumed that they've owned everything. And so they put everything up in digital. But when it comes to licensing something, uh, you know, we don't want to get sued and we're not sure and we need to be careful, you, you know, and even though I'm kind of saying that and being silly about it, that is the one commonality with all these labels. So going back to Res, one of the issues is artists, especially smart people like Glenn, they know what they own and what they don't and the stuff that they really don't. So it has nothing to do with really did Gurr release it, did they not? And do you remember what, what Hostage, what year did that come out? It came out in 94. 94. 84. 84. What label was it on? Was it Sparrow. just on? Sparrow. So it was on Sparrow. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe that, I believe most of that Sparrow stuff is Word. And so, um, and I have no idea when some of those Gur titles came out. Like, I don't know if, because Gur would have had to go license the stuff from Sparrow. Like, even though it's their album. Right. With their name on it. It's, they still don't own it. They they own the words that they wrote. They own the writers. They own the composition of it. Well, no, let me rephrase it. No, they own the writer. They own the writer's portion, but the label owns the composition. They can re-record the song and put it out, right. which is why Rex Carroll and I did that first White Cross album, 1987. 1987. That self-titled album. We couldn't get them to reissue it, remaster it, do anything with it. And I didn't know and understand the remastering space at that point or the reissue space. So I'm like, well, do you own the song? And he's like, well, I don't own the recording of the song, but I own the song itself. I have permission to go play it live and I can re-record it. So I paid for Mike Fian and Scott Wenzel. I paid for them to fly into Chicago and we recorded the whole album. I paid to have that album re-recorded. it turned out great. Thanks. And, you know, so sometimes you have that, but it just it just doesn't have the urgency of some of the earlier stuff. When you re-record it, it's just, can you imagine, think about this for a second. Can you imagine if Striper went in and re-recorded to Hell with the Devil now? They, like, they did think about that. a second coming, they recorded part of it. Right. So, so you go listen to that, any Striper fan, which I am, you know, massive Striper fan, have a great relationship with Ozzy, one of my greatest friends in life. And, um, but it just wouldn't have the same urgency as the initial album. You just can't create, re can't, you can't recreate magic sometimes. You just sure. can't do it. And, you know, maybe it's sacrilegious to talk about magic when we're talking about Christian music, but you get what I'm saying, right? Um, it's a cliche. The, the, the important part is understanding the, the value of what you got from an original recording and why remastering is usually way more sought after over re-recording an album, but it all comes down to rights. And, I, uh, so I tell people this when it comes to, well, why can't you just put this out? Why don't you just do this? Like, I don't understand. Why don't you just put out X Center? Get it. Like, I don't know. Like, why? Like, why don't you just do that one? <laughs> you know, it's funny because they just don't understand the business. And while well, we can't, and I answer to a much higher calling. Yeah, Greg, can you tell us, you probably can't, but any kind of hints or anything of what might be coming out in the future? Well, I, I'll, 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 I'll share two things. Um, one, <laughs> we are working behind the scenes a lot. Normally, you would already know by now some of the stuff, but because vinyl manufacturing is taking so long, instead of taking pre-orders and submitting it to vinyl manufacturing near the same day or, you know, the week before. Um, vinyl is now being pushed out eight and 10 months. There's people even getting quotes of 15 months to get their vinyl completed. It's like, it's an insane process of vinyl. COVID's just created a juggernaut of problems 
from an employment standpoint to a people getting materials to the plant with the stampers or, or working at a half, you know, but the printing company has the print work done, but the vinyl's coming from someplace else. And, you know, you have all these different pieces that are coming together to make one product. So you would normally buy something right now, but um, so there is some stuff that we're going to be announcing in August that's going to shock people because it's nothing from the 80s or 90s or even the 70s. It's going to shock people, but it's one of my favorite albums. It's not The Showdown, which I promoted often because that Backbreaker album, I'm just such a giddy old teenage fan of uh, The Showdown Backbreaker. There wasn't a lot of music in that time area that I loved, but uh, Showdown was definitely one of my favorites. David used to come to our booth all the time at Cornerstone Festival, just to hang out, you know. We just built a great friendship. And um, I'm a big fan of the music. So it isn't them, but it's another band that did have stuff out in the 90s. Uh, but it's a little bit later. Um, but soon, read between the lines, the wait will be over. The wait. So. Whoa. So. I'll let people just kind of sit on that. Um, the wait is over very, very soon. And people, I think, will love some of the stuff that we're going to put out. Um, it's not what would I consider a classic 80s Christian metal band, but we're putting out five albums, which will help narrow down some of that as well. We're putting out five albums by the band. The band had way more than five albums. Um, and um, it's going to be exciting. Um, because we're starting with one of my favorites, which is actually a self-titled album of theirs. We're going to put some other some other other stuff out. So I'm letting your brains just kind of spin to see if you get any hints at all. Is it Coral um, Loop? Because I will never I will never um, acknowledge or deny anything that you guys say. So you can speak out everything you want right now, and I'll just pretend like I'm still sipping my coffee. All I all I, when you said the wait is all I'm picturing is Coral Lou with the Waiting Room, which was a '90s band, and I, I actually like Coral Lou, and that was their last release several years ago. I'm probably so you're going to you're gonna have to put that. You have to put that up against something I said. I'm releasing an album. We're releasing an album that's a self-titled album, which was not their first album. It came quite a few albums later. It was just a self-titled, and it was not released in the '80s or '90s. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, and we're putting out five albums, four albums that came after that one. So you have to kind of go through these so you guys can try to piece the puzzle together. Um, they definitely are hard. They got some very melodic things in them, uh, but they're hard as well. Um, everybody will know this band, you know, it's a very, very well known band. Um, and I'll actually add this as well they are still actively touring. We will have to put our collective heads together, Greg, and, uh, and figure this one out. So, uh, okay, so on top of that, we also have uh, a couple albums coming out by an eight, a classic 80s band. And I think we're doing four or five albums by them. But that contract's not signed, so I'm just waiting. Just can't say anything um, on that one. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a really, really great band. You guys are going to love that one. And then um, I, we are working on more Petra. We've put in requests for Petra. I put in requests for the first two... Resurrection Band albums, but I just keep getting declined, but we keep trying. I keep flying to Nashville to have conversations with people and meet up with people, um, especially I'm hoping to be able to meet with Mike Kerb, who owns Ward Records, um, trying to get that aligned because they've become the um, uh, menace to society because they won't let us put anything out. Um, so and then uh, let's see, there was something else I wanted to say about some releases that we're putting out. Oh, and you know, I will tell people this. Um, we are putting out some more Rob Castles. Yeah. Um, and we're putting out uh, Carmen, which was the first Carmen album. And I got two minutes. Let me explain this real quick. 
nobody really knows this album, but this is an album called Kitten Jim and Lloyd. Uh, it came out in 1978. And uh, long and short, I was having a conversation with Jimmy Lloyd, and he told me, he says, I'm the one that found Carmen. Carmen came up to me as a teenager in the church and said, hey, how do I get in the music business, in the music space? And he says, well, son, you have to record an album. He's like, well, I got a bunch of songs done. He's like, cool, let's get you in the studio and record a first album, which got hush-hushed by Sony, and never, nobody ever knew that this thing ever existed. But on the back of it, it clearly says that it was produced. It's really, really tiny, but right there it says it was produced by Jimmy Lloyd, which is actually Kitten Jimmy Lloyd. And this was the first Carmen album that nobody knows existed. It wasn't even on Discogs or any place else until I started adding all the information out there about it. And so now Carmen's passed away. We've asked the estate for permission, even though Jimmy owns it. We wanted to be respectful of the time frame between when he passed away and when we put this out. And uh, so it's going to be a fun project. It's not metal. It's not even rock. It's just an elite CCM artist that put out some of the greatest stuff ever. And people just need to hear it. There was 400 vinyl copies made. 200 of them were destroyed in Carmen's trunk because they were supposed to bring him into his third show ever. But somebody left the trunk open and it rained all, all the, the whole time he was doing the show. The whole trunk got flooded. They took everything, threw it away. There was 200 copies that remained. That story came directly from Carmen when I met him and I verified that this album was legit. And so it's a really cool story surrounding that. So that's something that will be coming in time. But uh, I love Rob Castles. And so I've wanted for the last 10 years to do the other Rob Castles. So I'm doing them. Very cool. Greg, I know you're pressed for time, buddy. Thank you for sharing some wonderful information with us. And uh, we always do a quick scripture closeout at the end of every episode. And uh, Mike, if you don't mind taking us that direction. Yes, absolutely. In the spirit of what you do, Greg, taking all this great old classic Christian music and making it new again, um, I want to share the scripture from Revelation 21.5, which says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Well, here you go. We're all going to be remastered one day, right? Remastered by the master. <laughs> so, <laughs> Greg, thank you so much, my friend. Thanks for uh, gracing us with your time. It's been a pleasure. The honor was mine. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for your support. I know I say that all the time, but I genuinely mean it. I wouldn't be able to do what we do here at Herder if it wasn't for guys like you guys. So from the bottom of my heart, I appreciate you guys. I thank you for your support. Um, I feel like I found a family in the middle of all this. And I often like to refer to it as the Girder Army, owning my best Kiss Army thing. Um, but I really appreciate you guys um, for number one, your support, um, promoting what we do, loving what we do. And um, it's just it's just an honor to be able to be on this side of it, pushing stuff out, keep the requests coming, keep the interest coming. Let me know what you like, what you don't like. Um, let me know if you see problems, issues um, out there, something that, that needs to be addressed. Keep making fun of the way I spell things. It's fine. Does, does everything look healthy with the state of Christian rock and metal? Is it, a, is it healthy or does it seem to be? Um, you know, I'm on one side, right? I'm... I'm um, writing deals, doing contracts um, on stuff that's been out before. I don't actively get involved in a lot of the um, what's current and actively happening with current Christian bands. I have seen a really beautiful comeback. Um, it was getting really scary in like 2007, 2008-ish with you know bands out there that were toning down the swear words because they wanted to tap into the Christian market. And Christian bands toning down the God and Jesus because they wanted to get in the mainstream market. And there was a lot of this happening and there was, a, and cause there's really no Christian bookstores. There's really not even Christian labels anymore. So it's been harder and harder to find who is, who isn't, who has the beliefs. So you really have to hone in to the, for those who have ears to hear. Right. But it's also important as leaders in the, in the industry, 
that we promote the right stuff. And so I try to be honest with people when we're putting stuff out that isn't per se Christian, you know, um, you know, we just try to be upfront and be honest with people and let people know. I just meant really the interest in stuff like Bride Snakes in the Playground and these classics is there still an avid interest in these great albums. Yeah, it's, it's growing. Good. It, it's Good. growing. It's growing. You got dads showing their kids. You know, it's the reason why you see 19 year olds. I'm um, just checking the time. It's the reason why you see 19 year olds wearing, you know, Pink Floyd and Led Zeppelin and ACDC and Prince shirts. And you see, well, I mean, all that stuff. You walk into a Walmart or a Target and they have a line of 80s retro shirts. That helps all this industry whether it's a Motley Crue or whatever it is, it helps the entire industry, which funnels down into the Christian market and the Christian space. There is so much yet that's untapped. There's so much music out there that we haven't even begun to touch, begun to even think of so many great bands. There was way more than we ever knew. Um, and there's just many more that just could really, really use some great touches on some stuff which is why i put out the jags and the amy walters and the fighters and betrayals there was just so much out there you know and i was a big shout fan so put that stuff out Tampa stuff you know um but i know, I know you got a roll buddy thank you for uh for gracing us and, and i'll go ahead and uh we'll, we'll dive out of here thanks Greg. appreciate thank you guys you. thanks, thanks for watching we'll talk soon bye